I hope this has been a great week for you. It's been a great week for me. I've really enjoyed studying and thinking about prayer and hearing all the stories. In fact, if you have a testimony and God has done something special, please put that on Facebook or send it to uh, Pastor Terry at thefathershouse.com. We want to share your miracle of breakthrough with other people. Well, let's get started today. Today, I want to talk about learning how to pray with confidence. I wonder, do you pray with confidence? Are you really confident in your prayers? Or do you worry, am I praying right? Have I prayed long enough? Does God hear me? Am I praying in the right way? Do I have confidence? You see, confidence, if we're not careful, we begin thinking about confidence as confidence in me, in my ability, that if I pray right, then things are happening. But it's not confidence in ourself, but it's confidence in our Father, who is our God. So in this session two, and I hope you're taking notes there in your journal. I hope you bought a journal just for this 40-day prayer challenge because you get ready. You're going to have some awesome breakthroughs that you're going to want to share with other people. So I want to talk about how to pray with confidence. When Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray, the very next thing that he said is pray like this, our Father. They never were taught to pray like that. Throughout the Old Testament, God was never referred to as a father. He was referred to as a creator, as a deliverer, as a, uh, a, a God that judges, but never as a father. And Jesus uses this word for father, and it's the word Abba, which simply means daddy or papa. It, it was, it's a term of endearment, a, a term of intimacy, uh, a term of security. Jesus was telling them that when they pray and pray to God, remember that you're talking to your father. It's so important for Jesus because 120 times, in fact, 150 times, let me say it right. Over 150 times in the New Testament, Jesus calls God our father. He's not a power. He's a person. He's not a force. He's your father. So when we truly understand and know that God is our heavenly father, that'll radically change our prayer life. And it'll enable us to pray with confidence because we won't always be trying to impress him or, or overly please him. Like we, we've got to jump through all these hopes before we can come into his presence. Now, I know this may be a tough for some of you, I personally had a very loving father. I knew that he loved me. But some of you had a lousy father. You had a lousy relationship. Maybe I should say it like this. I wouldn't want to call your father lousy, even though he, he may have been. But you had a lazy and a lousy relationship with your father. And there's some deep father wounds that you carry. Because when you think about your earthly father, you think of all the things that went wrong and uh, how you were treated. And, and no wonder that you can't pray to God with confidence is because you have these father wounds. So if we're going to have breakthrough prayers and pray with confidence, then we need to learn how to be confident that God is our father. So I want to give you some truths. I want to dispel any uh, bad thoughts that you've had about father. And I want to give you some truths. So be sure to journal these in your journal. Number one, God is a caring father. He's a caring father. In Isaiah 49 and 15, this is what God says. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? He says, though she may forget, I will not forget you. He's a caring father. Uh, he says, look, Earthly parents, earthly mother, earthly father can forget about you and you feel like you're always out of their thoughts. But God says, I care for you and I can never forget you. Your failures, your mistakes, nothing you can do can cause God not to care for you. He cares for you. Romans 8 and 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, 
no, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us. Listen to this. Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In essence, it's saying you can't stop him from loving you. You can't stop him from caring about you. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is when the disciples were crossing the lake and Jesus said, I want you to go to the other side. And as they were crossing, they found themselves in a storm and Jesus was asleep in the boat. And so they began to feel like he wasn't caring for them. And so they woke him up and they said, don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're in this storm? And I wonder how many times we feel that. We feel like, I don't think God cares. He doesn't care about my marriage. I wonder if God cares about my finances or does he care about the anguish that I'm going through? Does he care about the bad doctor's report that I got this week? Yes, he cares. 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, cast all your care upon him. Would you say that with me? Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. How much of our cares? Part? No. What does he say? All. All of our. That means everything about you. Nothing is too small. Your health, your finances, your kids, your career. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the number of hairs on your head, and he actually knows the original color of your hair. So God is a caring father. Second of all, write this down, God is a consistent father, a consistent father. He's loving, he's caring, he's reliable. James 1 and 17 says, there is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle, nothing fickle about him. Uh, he's there. He loves us. He's consistent. Some of you may have come from homes where you didn't have a consistent father. You didn't know who you would wake up to in the morning or which father would come home at night. And so we spent a lot of our time trying to perform. You can't perform for this father because he cares for you. It's all about his character, not our performance. Malachi 3 and 6, he says, I am the Lord, and I don't change. I'm, con I'm consistent. I love the verse in 2 Timothy 2 and 13. Even when we are too weak to have any faith left, God remains faithful to us and will help us. For he cannot disown us. Oh, don't you love that? He cannot disown us who are part of himself. Uh, he, he cannot disown us who are part of himself and he will always carry out his promises to us. I know, some of you have had a lot of promises that your father has given you or other people, and your heart's been broken because people broke promises. Some of you had a, a very unpredictable, not a consistent father, but a very unpredictable father. You didn't know how he would treat you. You didn't know if he would give you a hug or if he would give you a slug. You might write this down because I think it's really important Inconsistent fathers produce insecure children. Inconsistent fathers produce insecure kids. Psalm 59 and 10 says, my God is changeless in his love for me. And when I understand that, I can pray with confidence that he's a caring father, that he's a consistent father. And the third one is God is a close father. He's a close father. He's not an absentee father. Uh, some of you, your father left you, moved away, so there's always been an absence there, or he would leave for weeks and come back. But God is not an abs absentee father. He, he never goes away. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, listen to all the knots in this. I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not. I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down or relax my hold on you. Wow, such loyalty. He never stops thinking about you before you were born. You were on his thoughts and in his thoughts. And now he never takes his thoughts off of you. That's the awesomeness of God. He knows everybody. 
and we are always in his thoughts. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18, listen to this. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. Here in Central Florida, we have uh, the Gulf on one side and we have the ocean on the other side. And when we go over there, you see all the sand. Can you imagine getting out there and sitting down and start picking up those grains of sand? One, two, three, four. People say, what are you doing? I'm trying to count how many grains of sand there are. No, it's impossible. And so it is with God. There's no way that you can count how much that he cares for you and how much he loves for you. See, here's some things that you need to realize. Write this down. God is never too busy for you. God is never too busy for you. He's never too busy for you. He never says, take a number and stand in line. He never puts you on hold. Psalm 27 and 10 says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Here's another thing to write down about God. God loves to meet your needs. God loves to meet your needs. Say this with me. God loves to meet my needs. Let's say it together. God loves to meet my needs. You, you need to know that because the devil will tell you, well, that's too small to pray about with all the conditions in the world. God doesn't care about. No, he cares about your needs. He's called Jehovah Jireh in the Bible. That means God provides. God provides. Uh, Matthew 7 and 11, if you then Though you're evil or you're imperfect is what it means, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What kind of gifts? Good gifts. Here's something else to write down. God is sympathetic to your needs. I said, God is never too busy for you. God loves to meet your needs. And God is sympathetic to your needs. Sometimes growing up, you may have had a dad or a mom that if you uh, hurt yourself or you fell or you're just going through a crisis, they'd just say, get over it, grow up, move on. But God never does that. In fact, Psalm 34 and 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Have you ever been brokenhearted? Have you ever been crushed in spirit, put down, feeling like there's no hope? Well, your heavenly Father cares about you. Psalm 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge, our strength, and an ever-present help in times of trouble. He never gets tired. He never gets tired of you praying, even praying the same prayer over and over and over. God, I'm struggling with this temptation. Help me. An hour later, God, I'm struggling with this temptation. Would you help me? Or maybe it's, God, I'm struggling with forgiveness. Would you help me? And 10 minutes later, God, I'm still struggling with this forgiveness. Will you help me? He never gets tired of you bringing that same prayer request to him. Now, the enemy would love for you to say, oh, no, you can't pray the same prayer over and over because you do. That's lack of faith. No, Jesus teaches that we should pray persistently until the answer comes, until he says no. We just keep praying persistently. Here's another thing to write down. God is a competent, comp comp competent father. In other words, you can count on him. You can count on him. Luke 1 and 37, nothing is impossible for God. That means he's competent. He can handle any crisis, anything you're going through, anything, anything. He's competent. Ephesians 3 and 20. I love this verse. God is able to do far more. Say that with me. Far more than we could ever dare to ask or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. What are you afraid to ask? What is there in, the, in your mind that you really would need a breakthrough in that area? What you're afraid to ask? Paul says, go ahead and ask him. Because he's able to do far more than that. You wanted that little thing. 
but it can do far more than that. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. He's a confident father. He's a caring father. He's a consistent father. He's a father that's close. And he's a competent father. All of those things assure us that we can pray with confidence. But now, here's a question I need to ask you. Are you certain that God is your father? I didn't ask, how long have you been going to church? I didn't ask, do you know about God the Father? I said, are you certain that God is your personal father? He's not the father of all. You, you understand that, right? Now, he is the creator of everyone, and he created us with a purpose, but not everybody's living the purpose. And he created us to be in his family, he wants to be our father, and he wants us in his family. But that doesn't mean that it happens automatically. We have to make that choice. We have to make that decision. So my question to you is, are you certain, without a shadow of a doubt, that God is your father? John 1 and 12 says, to all who received him, there it is, to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So how do I get in the family of God? Well, I believe that he's my father, that he died on the cross, that he sent his son Jesus Christ to pay for my sins. And I pray confidently and I invite him to come into my life. See, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, then God becomes your caring, consistent, close, competent father. And you can pray with confidence the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I love he doesn't say my father. He says our father, because that means that you're part of the family. We're in the family of God. Galatians 3 and 26 says, you are all God's children by believing in Christ Jesus. So here's my question. Have you done that? Are you sure of eternal life? Jesus is waiting for you. If you've never made that decision, he's waiting for you right now. It's not knowing about God. It's knowing him as your father. That's the most important decision you can make. Let me lead you in a prayer. I can give you the words. The words are really not all that important. It's the humbling of your heart and receiving Christ and knowing that he died for your sins. Let me lead you in a prayer. Let's all pray this prayer together in case someone in the group has never prayed this prayer. Father God, Thank you for loving me, for being a caring father, a consistent father, a competent father that can take care of my needs. I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life. I believe that he died for my sins and he rose again on the third day that I could have life. As best as I know how, I want to serve him. I want to be in his family for the rest of my life. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Wow. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer today for the first time or you rededicated your life to God, would you take just a few minutes and tell the people in your group, hey, I prayed that prayer today. I wanted to be sure that that happened in my life. Thanks. Well, I believe today is going to be a great day of discussion. I've got some great questions laid out for you. And I pray that you're continuing to do the things that we've talked about and that um, you're, you're journaling. And if you have an answer to prayer, please share it there with your life group. So anyway, let's get ready for a great discussion time, shall we? Enjoy this time together.